Praise the Lord. Right now I'd like to do this topic on everlasting righteousness. And this is found in Daniel 9. Okay, this is a popular passage, especially nowadays. And it was popular before. We have in Daniel 9 that the 70 weeks, okay, accomplish these things, okay, and one is everlasting righteousness, verse 24, and that is what I'm going to be honing in on in this presentation. The Bible is very circumspect when it comes to salvation. There's no guesswork anymore after what the Apostle Paul taught. Jesus, not to say guesswork was okay or something, but you can't really get around what I'm going to teach here to start with. Jesus came in and he died a martyr's death and he was given over into the hands of sinners and he was put to death in the flesh with quickened by the spirit and there is no doubt that his soul was made an offering for sins and he sits at the right hand of the father and he is ever living to make intercession for us he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek the atonement for sins has of course everything to do with what he did now does that mean we have everlasting righteousness from this amillennial perspective at the death of Jesus so or maybe it was just what he taught since to some of these guys that he taught new doctrine and he taught a new kingdom so maybe we just needed what he taught not to say that they would deny the blood but there are people that start to go that way that say you know we don't necessarily need these atonement teachings that we find in Hebrews or something like that I'm going to look at why we of course needed what Jesus did but since God prophetically was sending it out and his word was accomplishing what it would and what it will do faith in that prophetic voice from God was sufficient okay which of course we understand if there was faith in the Old Testament there had to be repentance but my point is is that looking forward to what Jesus did is what got you saved Paul taught in Romans 3 that the Torah the Mosaic law witnessed it testified of the righteousness that was in Christ without the Torah okay so Paul was one of the hardest teachers of law okay but he also taught against the need for the Mosaic law but he did teach that the Mosaic law witnessed of the righteousness that is without the Mosaic law which would mean men could have faith be in line with the law of faith and be saved under the Torah. Okay. Did they need the Sermon on the Mount to be saved? No. Did the kingdom that they had in Israel deter them from salvation? No. Is it true that when Paul taught imputation and he taught about sins being covered, is it true that David and Abraham were used in Paul's teaching? Yes. Did Paul say there was a different faith? That there was a different imputation than that of Abraham or David? Of course not. So my point is, to start with, if everlasting righteousness 
and Daniel's teaching in Daniel 9 came at the incarnation. Maybe they'll speed up 30 years, give or take, to when Jesus started his ministry. And maybe they'll culminate in the death, burial, resurrection. Did we need those things to literally happen? I know we need them prophetically for who I'm discussing right now, people like Abraham and David. Maybe another way to word it would be, did Jesus bring in a new salvation, a new kingdom? And the answer is, of course, he did not. And it would be a false teaching to say he did. Because how could Paul relate it back to Abraham, David, how could the apostles use Solomon's teaching on grace if what Jesus came teaching was different? If Jesus came teaching a new kingdom, how could men in the old kingdom be saved if we need the new kingdom to be saved? I just don't think a lot of people have thought this out. And you start to run into major problems. And if you do not humble yourself quickly, you start to get further and further away. And I'm not saying all people do this, but it's a stronghold for preterism. Okay. And that's where people sometimes end up. Now, I could look at different things like Psalm 19 would be an example that everlasting righteousness was taught in the Old Testament. You could look at the various different places of the teachings of the kingdom. And if the prophets are still a foundation to this faith, and they are, because that's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, then we know that this kingdom is definitely a literal kingdom that was already there in days of old. That is something that is going to be restored. So it cannot be a new kingdom that Jesus was preaching. But the prophets prophesied of the first coming, yes, was needed to happen, yes, but the faith was sufficed. So if the faith was sufficed before, it cannot be something new that Jesus taught vis-a-vis -a, -vis a kingdom or imputation. Okay, because the prophets were getting saved with the imputation that was taught to them from patriarchs or you know psalmists or something like this and they had the kingdom and you know they thought it was holy okay and god gave them the directions and things like this so we do see everlasting righteousness taught in the book of psalms 119 so it is there what does everlasting righteousness mean then in Daniel 9. Did the first coming suffice it? Are we there? Has it been fulfilled in its entirety? Well, the answer clearly is no. Based on what I just said is enough. But if you read Daniel 9, it's imperative to go the extra detail here because it's impossible to believe the first coming brought in this everlasting righteousness. And why that is, I'm not saying the first coming was not needed because it is needed. Because if you really follow it strictly to get into the kingdom that Jesus is coming back to restore, which is taught in parables, he had to have died. I mean, this is no doubt, no brainer. But it's also worked into how it's taught in the prophets that this king from Judah, who is also the high priest, can bring in his people with his own blood, bring some of those people back with him, some who just, you know, change when he comes. We that are alive and remain. And all these things have to be working together for these all to come about. And they do with Jesus, who can be a high priest and a king. And he can sit on David's throne. He can sit on the Father's throne, which are not the same, and things like this. I mean, it all does really come together. It takes time to go.
go through all the verses and put them together as well, but it is something to glorify God for. It's not that the first coming is not immensely important, but the 70 weeks and something like everlasting righteousness it has to do with the second coming. All right. And the main reason you can make what I said just prior to the main reason, but this point here in the last verses of this chapter speaks for itself that the first coming and how it all comes together and the Messiah was cut off is only 69 weeks. Does that make any sense? Because what I'm saying here is the verbatim reading of Daniel 9.24, that it's 70 weeks that are determined to do these things. And one of them is to bring in everlasting righteousness. Jesus was put to death at 69 weeks. So what is the other week then? You know, how would that even work? I mean, I think it's a fair way of reading it. I don't, I mean, I know this is, you know, like the quote unquote hard futuristic view, you know, of a seven year tribulation and Jesus returning to set up a literal kingdom, which is all over the Bible, literally. However, my point is he died at 69 weeks. Okay, so here's what people have done because they don't want a future 70th week because how could they really have it? If they want a new kingdom that Jesus taught, some of it to them is just a spiritual kingdom. If they want all these new teachings coming in, they don't want any millennium, which is a thousand year in the future. They don't want none of that. They got to get 70 weeks at the time of Jesus' first coming then. So then what they do, and I've seen it, is that they say that this covenant here by the one in verse 27, which is definitely not Jesus, but they make it about Jesus, okay? That in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So to them, they got to get this all surrounding Christ, the first coming, all 70 weeks. So then they say his death put an end to the daily sacrifices or however they would word it exactly. It caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, his death. All right, so we know that it is a Christian doctrine that the death of Christ was the nailing of the law of Moses to the cross, okay? And like the feast days, how Paul worded it in Colossians 2 is, you know, the best way to say it. And there is no doubt that the death of Jesus is the nailing of that, these ordinances. So you don't have to keep the Sabbath and you know things like that. And there's no doubt about that. However, it still doesn't fit with what they're saying. It's not even proper way of reading the passage. But then everlasting righteousness still takes three and a half more years. So if Jesus died in the midst of the week, of this last week, and this is how they want to try to get around all this. It's in the midst of the week. There's still three and a half years left. So then they have their fancy timetables. I've seen them that they'll push it out three and a half more years from the cross to maybe Stephen's death. I think I saw that example. I don't know what that made for a difference here in these 70 weeks, but they got to push it out somewhere, right? There's got to be three and a half more years somewhere right under this view that jesus died in the midst of the 70th week and you know he took away the torah and all this you still got three and a half more years before we get to everlasting righteousness because daniel started by saying it's 70 weeks i understand it can be exhausting if you're someone that has also put time in on some of these doctrines regarding eschatology, because there are people at stake here. You know, full preterism is deplorable, okay? It's awful, okay? And then you start getting into these other doctrines like pre-trib, what spirit is that coming from? You know, I mean, these people aren't even prepared to go through the tribulation, you know? And there's different things, I understand, but 
none of it will ever make sense. All right. I don't think it's too big of a point, but maybe worth mentioning quick is that, you know, the law of Moses was never there to take away sins. I know I mentioned Romans 3 earlier, which I believe is verse 21, but it never took away sins. That was never the point of it, right? So then people see these things in the future, whether it's Ezekiel's temple, I don't know, it might get worked into this discussion of Daniel 9, what Jesus did, but it was never there to take away sins. It was there to point to something. You know, so it does not have a big barrier on any of these doctrines. And that would prove then that these people had the kingdom inwardly before Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus taught that David said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said unto my Lord. David saw things in the future based on the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the Holy Ghost was in David. It says in the prophet Ezekiel that God would be a sanctuary to them in the place of their captivity. You know, and it talks about this in the Psalms that Judah was his sanctuary, if I'm not mistaken. And David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I don't really know why they believe these things other than the fact that I know it's very popular it can sometimes be the first thing that you were taught. There's a new kingdom now. Jesus came with a new kingdom. It's a new thing. It's just not. You know, it's simply not. The idea of having the inward Holy Ghost was in the Old Testament. You had to be saved to then enter into the kingdom in the future, according to prophecy. Now, they did at times have the kingdom on earth, men that were saved, knew how it ran. They understood the way it worked. They also saw the prophecies that there would be destruction to it and that the Messiah would build it back up. He could not build it back up spiritually. He can't undo what he already did. He was given men the Holy Ghost before. It says in the Psalms that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him. Now, if you think about it, that's no mere angel that's being spoken of. It could mean as well to be translated the messenger of the covenant in other places. And it could be the messenger of the Lord in this place, the angel of the Lord. Okay. So the messenger of the Lord is indeed Christ in this Psalm pre-incarnate. How can a mere angel encamp around all the saints? He can't. Okay. But Jesus can because he's God. Okay, so he is with them. He was their savior. This is taught by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 63. What he came teaching was what he was teaching before. Okay, and he got balances always perfect between the Mosaic law and the law of faith and misuse of scripture and the proper use he nailed it every time but you have to see what he was teaching and you got to get it connected to the prophets the foundation is not just the apostles it's the prophets and the apostles okay you're not getting the right headstone you're not getting the right cornerstone okay when you just have one piece of that foundation okay and the head of the corner, you know. So I'm going to end at Isaiah 51. And Isaiah 51 is a good chapter about those that have righteousness today, which is an everlasting righteousness based on having the Holy Ghost. But then they look toward the second coming where there is also everlasting righteousness, and this for the kingdom, and this for Zion, okay? And this is not Zionism. I've had to bring this up before. But this is teaching that you can have the Holy Ghost inward, and you can also see the prophecy given by the Holy Ghost 
of the kingdom of the Messiah. And perhaps my video on 2 Peter 3 would be a good point of reference to, to some of the language we will see here in Isaiah 51. That the timetable has to be there, okay? Because what you do see here in Isaiah 51, I'll go there quickly here. Start at the start of the chapter and bring up a few things that I aforementioned. So we have those that hearken to the Lord and they that follow after righteousness that seek the Lord. Okay. They're still called to look unto the rock. Okay. And then it says, look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. So that has to mean something. All right. They already have righteousness. They're not going to get it from Abraham, right? There is covenants in the Bible, the throne of David, okay? And there's also given to Abraham, okay, the land. I believe the circumcision portion of the nation of people was fulfilled. I believe this is what's taught in the book of Acts. But you have these things in the Bible that the possibility is certainly there. It's not impossible that the Bible teaches that Abraham will one deed inherit that land that was promised. But this is the saying in verse two, nonetheless. In the third verse, the Lord shall comfort Zion. Okay. He will comfort all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Now, I don't see how this is relatable just to initial salvation. I don't see how this is only relatable to the first coming because it already talks about people that are hearkening unto the Lord, that are following righteousness, that seek the Lord in verse 1. And then it talks about something in the future in verse 3. Okay, so we see there's no antinomians verse 4 and here in verse 5 it says my righteousness is near my salvation has gone forth and my arms shall judge the people the isles shall wait upon me and on mine arm shall they trust here in verse 6 you see some of this judgmental language okay i mentioned in my video on second peter 3 there is a relation to this in the book of revelation and elsewhere in the prophet isaiah that this magnitude of judgment that is coming at the second coming is spoken of in this way, but the manner in which it is spoken of does not mean the earth will cease to exist the day that Jesus returns. And I went through all those verses and how they relate to the seals, similar to what we see here in Daniel 9, impossible to get the timetable prophetically to work itself out, whether it's amillennialism, or having the 70 weeks fulfilled surrounding the first coming. Okay, so you can go into that video that I bring up the scriptures about that. But here it says, But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Okay, so based on everything we see here in these six verses, what he's coming to do has to do with Salvation that is forever, okay, and righteousness that shall not be abolished. And this would agree with everlasting righteousness. So we should expect by what Daniel taught that the 70th week will end at the second coming. And that agrees with what is written in Daniel 9. And this would agree with this banishing and the earth shall wax old like a garment language as well that we see in second peter revelation other parts of the prophet isaiah so praise the lord happy is he that hath the god of jacob for his hope whose hope is in the lord his god which made him Oh,
eyes of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous.